Welcome back to another episode of the B2B Founder Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Trainer. In today's episode, I speak with Tim Ash. Tim is an evolutionary psychology expert and world-renowned keynote speaker. He is well-known for his two best-selling books, Landing Page Optimization and Unleash Your Primal Brain. He's also a sought-after marketing advisor who founded Digital Growth Unleashed. Now he's the CEO and co-founder of SiteTuners, a digital optimization agency that has been helping businesses scale since 2001. Most of our work as business owners involves a lot of thinking, but how much do we really know about our brain power and mental capabilities? There's so much of our brain that we don't understand yet, but the propensity to do the things that we do goes all the way back to our primal instincts. However, you're thinking, what does understanding our brain have to do with marketing and business? Well, let's unravel the mystery with Tim and start learning how to work more efficiently and more effectively. Now, on to the interview. Hey, Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Brett. Very happy to be here. It's my absolute pleasure to have you on. I've been looking forward to, to having this conversation for a couple of reasons, which we will get into. One, I don't usually get, you know, a call you scientist or pseudoscientist or scientist <laughs> Pseudo research. Scientist. Yes, I play one on TV. <laughs> And I don't want to diminish the book because it was phenomenal, but that combined with your, your unbelievable marketing background is just, is just fascinating to me. So I'm, I'm super excited to have this conversation. So to start with now that I've really probably confused people who I'm talking to, what we're talking about, why don't you give us a little bit of Tim about your background and, and what you're working on today? Yeah, well, absolutely. So I go way back. I was kind of a scientist. I almost got my PhD in computer science, what would now be called deep learning or AI, something like that. My undergrad majors were in computers and cognitive science. So I did a little bit of time on the academic side. And then I started my first business and essentially ran a digital optimization agency for the last 25 years. So from the very early days of the internet, and the focus was on something that's now called CRO or conversion rate optimization. And that's just a fancy way of saying making websites more effective. So a higher percentage of your visitors act when they get there. And you, know, you can't fake that stuff. So we battle tested in my agency what really works and worked with the Siemens, Expedia's, Google's, Facebook's of the world and created 1.2 billion in documented value. So uh, along the way, I wrote a couple of best-selling marketing books on landing page optimization and founded the first international conference series on, on the topic, which is now called Digital Growth Unleashed. I'm not involved in that or the agency anymore, but the conference continues on every year in US, UK, and Germany. So that's the short version of the long version. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's fascinating. Like when you're saying 25 years, I'm like, that's pre-digital, but it's really not now that that's what mid-90s. Yeah, mid-90s, uh, shortly after Al Gore invented the interwebs. <laughs> right on. <laughs> and I do, I was part of that kind of that digital bubble, just got my first taste of it in the late 90s, 2000, and then didn't disappear because it was going to be here to stay. But I think a lot of people don't realize how far back you know this actually goes and the amount of to be able to optimize back then with those big brands. And it's funny how many people still struggle with this today, right? You would think 25 years later, it'd almost be fundamental to, to businesses, but it's really not. I'm, is that fair? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. One of my professors at UC San Diego, which is a top research university was Don Norman. He was kind of the godfather of user centered design. In fact, he literally wrote the first book on it and we used that as a, an undergraduate textbook back in the mid eighties. And you know what, here it is 30 years later. And finally the notion of actually designing things for the intended end user is finally starting to catch on. But as I always like to joke, there's no shortage of shitty websites in the world. So I have job security forever. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I, I think you're hundred percent in, you know, the world and you, you're obviously been in this world too, but the the B2B space, I think, is just historically slow to adopt. And there's some companies that are actually doing a good job and they got out ahead of the curve. But, you know, I think with post-pandemic or even in the pandemic, 
digital, you have to be able to be super efficient and strong with your digital presence or you're, in, you're out of business essentially, right? <laughs> Yeah, I read somewhere that earlier on in the pandemic, the e-commerce adoption, and not B2B, but e-commerce adoption went up more in 12 weeks than it had in the preceding 12 years, wow. in terms of the percentage of sales happening online. So yeah, it's not this kind of steady ramp up. There's been this massive discontinuity because people are forced to do things virtually and from home. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I get a lot of mixed signals from, especially some of the larger legacy B2B orgs, right? That they're just riding this out, right? They're, they've got patchwork processes in place to, you know, work with their customers during this, but believe that, you know, coming out the other end, it's going to return closer to what it was before. I'm, I don't think so, man. The cat's no, out of no, the bag. There is no going back. The way to think about it is that there's, it's habits, and habits take a while to form depending on exactly what you're trying to make a habit of, but that's a matter of weeks or months. And we've been in this pandemic of, at this point for seven or eight months. So right. that's, that's certainly long enough to change a lot of habits. And yeah, those are permanent. I hadn't thought about it that way, but even just from the buying, but I think about you know, the work from home crowd and right. I think if it was only a two or three or four week thing where you had to send everybody home, but you're right, eight, nine months. I can't imagine there's too many people going there. Yeah, sign me up. I want to go back and you know commute an hour and a half to the office and work there for <laughs> yeah. Well, that and- sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> no, and you know it's funny because I'm a firstborn, which are traditionally the more kind of say conservative uh, children in terms of birth order. So I've never been particularly an early adopter. But then I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I made the switch. I mean, these are obvious things. So just recently, I switched to using calendaring software. Just like here's my link. Find a time that works for you. I mean, just all that endless chasing people back and forth for, are you available at this time? Those monotonous email chains. Now I finally switched. I'm never going back. Right. No, a hundred percent. I'm getting better. And, and we even found a way because I had to, I synced up with your calendar to make sure that we had the right Zoom link and it was super easy. I'm, I'm with you. Pick a time <laughs> that works for you. Here's where we're available. Yeah, the six or seven iterations of the email thread is not productive whatsoever. So, which is kind of a little bit of a segue into the book that you wrote recently, right? I mean, why did you decide to write a book? I know you had wrote, written some bestsellers before, but heavily focused on where your background was, which was in marketing and yeah, conversion optimization. Marketing. But what led you to the, the primal brain? <laughs> Well, I guess you could say in a way it's full circle because again, that was my graduate work and UCSD was very interdisciplinary. I had people from electrical engineering, linguistics, computer science, and economics on my PhD committee. So a lot of cross-pollination going on. So I've always been interested in cognition and the brain and self-learning systems. And so then I applied that to marketing, as I mentioned. Now I've kind of come full circle. And the reason that I wrote the book was a lot of our clients at my former agency, Site Tuners, they use this stuff ethically, but most of that 1.2 billion in value was due to essentially these subconscious manipulation, what would now be called neuromarketing or something like that. And they have the advantage, you know, they have the data scientists and the machine learning algorithms and the market research and the demographic data on you. And they combine it all and they strip mine us for value and money and division and attention and all of that stuff. And so as consumers, it's like bringing a knife to the proverbial gunfight. And I'm just trying to level the playing field, say, hey, this is how your brain really works. And this is how big companies and governments are actually manipulating you. So it's a more, I guess, realistic look at how our brains work. And to me, that's due to the evolutionary arc. So life's been around for three and a half billion years on this planet. But, and so you have to go back and retrace the whole arc of and what we picked up from earlier forms of life and what makes us uniquely human at the very end of that. Yeah. And I know we were talking offline, but I, I love this book. It was, I told you, it was a perfect blend of science, but yet it was storytelling. And, you know, it was, it was, I don't say it was an easy read, but it was an enjoyable read, which well, even going you. into it, I have no idea what I'm, I'm getting and signing up for, but I'm always curious about one, how the brain works and are we being manipulated, which you kind of <laughs> alluded to that we can be. And I just, you know, there was a lot of insights, like some mammals don't have a brain or don't think it's all either reactionary, or they're just programmed to do certain things. And 
some minutes I was reading them, like, man, you would be perfect to come on and, and kind of talk about kind of next gen, right? Is is yeah. worked in this audience is, you know, or, or last gen, I would say, you know, because a lot True. of this stuff doesn't change. And that's the, the uh, so, so thank you. I mean, I tried for that balance in the book of, you know, accessible, but not lightweight. I mean, when I was done writing a chapter, I just stopped, you know, it, it was, there's no filler, there's no transition, but also there's no footnotes or end notes or jargon that you have to remember. You know, it's really designed to be a straight read through because I knew I was going to record the audio book and so on. So it's, it's designed to be accessible, but it's pretty meaty at the same time. Yeah. And, and even because I know part of the audience. I w- I'm more of a hard copy, take notes, but I actually listened to yours on Audible. And surprisingly, with my short attention span, I remembered <laughs> quite a bit because of just the way it flows, the themes. And, you know, as we were talking a little bit offline, there was a number of, you know, interesting facts that I, I took away from, from that. So I highly encourage people, if you're curious about this at all, which I think you should be, you know, check it out. So yeah, thanks. And there's a lot in there. I mean, everything from memory to learning to our happy chemicals and stress chemicals in our brain to language, culture, our social natures, conformity, things like that. So, you know, what I tried to do is break down all the silos, you know, there's behavioral economists working in their own silos, the neuroscientists in another one, and then there's the habit change people and the personal growth people. And everyone's looking at the elephant, the proverbial, you know, blind men touching different parts of the elephant. And I want to say, here's the elephant. This is what it looks like. Yeah. And it was effective. And, you know, when I was, I was starting to think about pre, before we were on the interview, I'm like, well, we can talk. I think because there's really two paths that we could take and maybe we can strike the, the balance is, you know, from a personal development standpoint, as a founder, we do a lot of things, you know, how do I optimize and maximize my time mm-hmm. for, for what I'm doing. And then two, how do I apply, you know, kind of what I've learned to my growing business, right? Yeah. So, and maybe we can take shorts and then people can go read the book and find the rest of it. But because you had touched on some of the personal development. So maybe we start there. What are maybe two or three things that you no. would want founders to be? Well, I, I'd, I'd say, this. so there's really kind of three audiences for the book. It's a general purpose book. So this is about the why of our brains and how they evolved. So it's not applied to anything. Originally, uh, I was going to write a neuromarketing book and apply it to marketing, but I didn't. This is, so this is like we're business people. You know, if your leadership, sales, marketing, persuasion, all of that, you, there's, you can mine it. And that was my, what my background was in. But it's also for like relationships, understanding tribes, power dynamics, culture, values, things like that. And then there's the personal development side, which is how do you be a better human and take yourself into better account, sleep, creativity, gender differences, you know, conformity, all of that kind of stuff. So it, it's, it's really not an applied book at all. It's a make you think kind of book. Yeah, no, and it did. Yeah, the one thing early on struck me was that your, our long-term memory is not very accurate. And how yeah. the memory actually works was fascinating that, you know, it, it's burning energy and, it, and maybe just unpack that a little bit. How about sure. Yeah, so there's a lot of misconceptions about memory. And I don't know if you've ever watched uh, it Black Mirror, that kind of oh, yeah. just, that sci-fi uh, series. And, it's, and there's this thing about like life rewind. One of the episodes is like, just go back and you could watch any part of your life. Well, there's no such thing. There's no perfect recall. There's no rewind of your life that's possible. Your brain is a very energy intensive system and its job is to forget stuff. So 99.9% of stuff is just flushed immediately. It's not even remembered. But if it is remembered, it's going to be the really salient things that help you to survive. Like, wow, I better remember that next time. I burn my hand on the hot stove, you know, that kind of stuff. So you remember things that are formed in strong emotional circumstances that are multi-sensory. Imagine going down a roller coaster, right? Winds whipping through your hair, your stomach's conspiring with your inner ear to evacuate your lunch and, you know, you're scared and there's screaming and, you know, so like that's going to get remembered, right? We're just yes. tying your shoes again for the thousandth time. You don't need to remember that. Yeah. So memories are formed only under emotionally strong, multi-sensory conditions. And even then they, they fade and they get forgotten unless you need to, unless they continue to have survival value. Yeah, that was interesting. And I think you even mentioned in the book about music, right? We can almost all picture, we knew from our high school or anywhere a song, we can almost flash back to that point in time. I'm like, yeah, he's 
absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, if, especially if you really like the song or hated it. I mean, there's both sides work. It's not just like happy times that you remember. In fact, a lot of times we're more sensitized to fear and loss and negative things, and we remember those. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, the other thing I found interesting was... I'm using my word, so please correct me. But, you know, the autopilot versus conscious, right? Where you're making decisions and the autopilot yeah. was not good or bad necessarily, but you're just pointing out what the differences were, right? And I don't think many of us think about that in a day and day and day. Well, I think that this is from a cultural standpoint. I start the book with this. No, my chapter one literally is the lie of rationality. And we have this stuff going back to Socrates where you know, our rational mind is the important part. And if we could only tame those wild horses of emotion and passion, then we'd have a great life like Mr. Spock or something on Star Trek. <laughs> and in reality, it's just the opposite. Said, if you think of evolution, there's stuff that worked. It worked for insects, reptiles, mammals. You know, it's still working there for us, and and that handles 95% of the of our life. And it's only when something is not a danger or is interesting and not dangerous that our conscious brain even gets to take a look at it. And even when it does, the decisions are made emotionally. There's literally no way to make a decision without emotion. So it's like, yeah. either I like it or I hate it. That's what narrows the choices. So the conscious brain gives us options, but emotions are the ones that decide always. There's no exceptions to that. Hmm. So this whole viewpoint of the conscious brain being dominant is ridiculous. And anybody that tries to operate from that place is going to be missing much of life. Yeah, it's interesting because I think he even gave an example later in the book talking about the autopilot in athletics. And when you override autopilot on a golf course, I believe was the example that that's when you miss putts and choke because you're no longer just doing it's you're thinking and overriding and it's causing the breakdown. Like, Yeah, exactly right. So if you, you know, they talk about in terms of learning, there's four stages. You probably heard this formulation. There's unconscious incompetence. I don't even know what I don't know. There's conscious incompetence. I know that I don't know it. There's conscious competence. means I have to think about it, but I can do it right. And then there's unconscious competence, which is mastery. It's become automatic to do it right. And so, yeah, choking is going from the flow state, from the zone of unconscious competence and dropping down into conscious competence where you're trying to you know, like a bad puppeteer mechanically do things by thinking about them. And that's not what the conscious brain is designed for. So you screw up and that's choking. Yeah. Or even us amateur golfers, when you start too many swing thoughts, it's not going to work well, right? <laughs> yeah. And I know there's people that'll think eight or nine things for each swing. I'm like, you got to get to a point where you just swing and then you figure out what happened afterwards. But I guess that comes back to repetition and practice. Right? Yeah. And by the way, an, an analogous, very important concept is whether you're learning intellectual stuff or experiential stuff or me you know, mechanics or physical things. If you don't sleep the night after you learn it, you lose the skill. So it doesn't matter how much you practiced your golf swing. If you got a bad night's sleep afterwards, you lost all the benefit. That was, that was really interesting. And I've actually tried to incorporate that into my pre-bed routine where if I'm thinking about things or things that were important, I came across, I'm kind of rehashing or going through it before I go to bed. And, you know, even because they used to, and it would probably all this, so you lay down, you're about to ready to go to bed and you think about something like, man, if I don't write this down, I'm never going to remember it in the morning. But now after reading this, I'm, I think you just think through it. And I've actually been remembering it back in the morning. So either I'm, convincing myself or you know i, I so, so here's a couple of tips for bedtime routine one is don't keep your phone in your bedroom i park it on a charger in my in my living room literally have everything structured so there's not those kind of distractions the other is if you have any worries whatever you're thinking about in the last hour before sleep gets processed about five times as much as the rest of the day's events combined. Oh, interesting. So it's really important. So if you go to bed worrying, your mind's going to spend the night tossing and turning and thinking about it. So I actually unload my brain. If it's something I have to do in the morning, I jot it down on a post-it note, which I keep near my bed. And that way I don't have to think about it at night. Yeah, that's And then really I can choose advice. to be more conscious about what I put into my brain before I go to sleep. So yeah, that's I unload the brain. Just so it's not you know, there. 
And I'm not sure if it was within your book. I may have read something on sleep elsewhere that it is about, oh, no, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Probably didn't get not a good enough night. sleep last night. No, sleep, exactly. <laughs> Shoot, if it comes back to me. But yeah, and that, that whole section was interesting. That's something I've been really trying to incorporate more is into sleep so I'm more productive in the morning, in the day. and Yeah, so, so let's talk about sleep, if you don't mind, a little yeah, bit. Because please. I think it's critical. It's life support. We tend to think of it as optional. It's like, I'm not being efficient unless I stay up and do more stuff. Well, every form of life that lives more than a few days on this earth has some form of sleep. So to think that it's somehow optional for us is ridiculous. In fact, there's an even more demanding form of sleep for us because when we came out of the safety of the trees, unlike our great ape cousins who sleep 10 to 15 hours a day, we had to shorten our sleep to seven to nine hours. But the sleep became more intense and the things okay. we do in it are, were even more necessary for kind of life support, if you will. So if you shortchange yourself on sleep, you're really screwing yourself up. So a lot of people talk about exercise and diet and then sleep is kind of an afterthought. No, sleep's foundational. You don't get the benefits of exercise or diet like losing weight unless you're getting proper sleep. And every mental health condition, every major mental health condition involves a sleep disturbance. Think about that. Yeah, that's so in, in most of your important sleep, your REM sleep is tail weighted at the end of the night. And so you have these 90 minute cycles of sleep with the REM sleep at the end. If you don't get that final one, you're really going to be wake up making bad decisions, misjudging social cues, thinking people are more aggressive towards you. And we've all experienced that. Oh, yeah. sleep. But it don't, if you're getting six hours, that's not enough. You need the seven to nine. And that's what, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it used to be, the culture used to be work, 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 18 hours yeah, and yeah. grind it out. It's not, that's just not productive. And again, it took me 50 years to embrace <laughs> the sleep more than, than I had, but definitely getting better, more of a routine. And yeah, I, the only reason the phone's, I never check my phone. It's just the alarm in the morning. Yeah. You know what? Simple solution. I buy an alarm clock. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that is true. Like just because it has an alarm clock doesn't mean it's the only way to get an alarm clock. I just bought one on Amazon, 20 yeah, bucks. You can find anything on Amazon. But to, to your point on the, the last 90 minutes of the, the REM sleep, I do find for whatever reason, if the, the cycles get out of whack and I wake up, if I wake up at the, the breaking point, I always feel much better. But if it's in the middle, then it just, it takes me longer to wake up. It's just not the, so I think there's always going to be working on it, but you know, the advice to all the founders out there, value your sleep. Yeah. Prioritize sleep over everything else. Like my kids are teenagers and my wife's a bit of a night owl to put it mildly. And I'm just like, have a nice night, 10 o'clock. I'm going to bed because at six o'clock, my body wakes me up. Yeah. It's first light. It's just happening naturally. And you know, teenagers have a later sleep cycle, but that's okay. It doesn't yeah. mean that I'm going to stay up and babysit them. But they can start to embrace better sleep earlier, right? I mean, my, do my oldest daughter is 25. She actually is really good about getting her sleep, not on weekends, but during the week. She's actually <laughs> early to early bed, early to rise. So yeah, I don't think there's any disputing it. So again, founders take that to heart. If you're going to sacrifice anything, don't sacrifice the, the sleep. And Amen non-starter so even along those lines i think the other one that we all kind of know but maybe we don't we think we're better than that is the multitasking right ha. okay so good news and bad news parts of your brain multitask but not the ones you think so you know if we break it up into that unconscious part of the brain the primal brain and then the conscious one that can form rational thoughts plan have access to language that part can't multitask at all so if you think you're multitasking on tasks for productivity, what you're actually doing is resetting and spending a lot of time context switching between tasks and eating up most of your productivity. So it's really, really stupid to multitask. What you should allow yourself is like really deep, go deep and uninterrupted on a task till it's finished. Yeah. Don't, don't multitask. The unconscious part of the brain, by contrast, does everything multitasking. I mean, there's millions of things impinging on you every second of every day. The pressure on your butt right now as you're sitting in that chair, the tone of voice and the sound waves between us, the lighting in the room, your emotional state, how hungry you are, the relationship of every joint in your body in terms of you know, your orientation and space. It's the reason why when we're you know, 
eating a salad, we don't stick the fork in our forehead usually, <laughs> right? We know where our, our arms and legs are relative to our mouth. So all of that information is coming in and it's tireless and is being processed 24 seven, digestion, respiration, all of that stuff. And, but it doesn't mean it's actively paid attention to. So the part that multitasks, you don't have access to. Right. The conscious part doesn't multitask. It's that yeah. simple. And that's, you know, we've been hearing that for a while, but yet there's still folks that believe, hey, I'm doing these three things, I'll knock it off. You're just better <laughs> off, pick one, to your point, get it done and then move on. And, you know, we're starting to hear more about the, you mentioned a little bit earlier, we didn't dig in with, you know, the flow state, right? Of, you yeah. know, as more and more workers are becoming knowledge workers, yeah, you know, a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but, you know, we talk the, the old, I say the old, you know, nine months ago in the corporate world, right? The office setting, you've got walk-bys, you've got open office, you've got how anybody got any real uh, work done there still yeah. to this day, I think back and go, how did we get it and throw meetings in there? We're really not. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, this, all of that's been debunked. The reality is that companies buy giant buildings and put cubicles in them because it's cheaper for them, right? And Harvard Business Review and many others have done extensive studies and the open concept office is ridiculous and stupid and kills productivity. You know, and that's, that's just that. Again, I'm going to have an opinion or two, but, but that one's pretty obvious. So, and then it goes wholly to distraction. Yeah. It goes wholly to the fact that you, there's always somebody going through your visual field and we can't avoid not looking at something moving in our visual field because that might be a bear that's attacking us. <laughs> right. Back right. To survival, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So just somebody, somebody went and scratched their butt and they're sitting next to you. I was like, I don't need that. So actually the most productive thing is single offices. And even in that, to back to your other point on the multitasking, right? The, the reset that it takes, even just somebody walking by, all of a sudden you're couple minutes it's got to be a couple minutes before you can yeah. get refocused right and yeah and it doesn't it doesn't improve creativity or collaboration or any of that i mean if, if we worked with a lot of clients you know big companies like google and shutterstock and they're all open concept and half the people have headphones on just to be able to tune shit out right you know it's a coping mechanism but it's not exactly ideal so I'm going to put you on the spot here and maybe you have the answer to this or you don't and you can kick me later if that's the case. But, you know, as we're heading into a new work environment, right? And again, I'm using my 25-year-old daughter's relatively new to the workspace, but she mm -hmm. worked in office for, now she's working from home and she's seeing the productivity of being able to get things done undistracted. So where, I mean, I'm just curious from your perspective, how inefficient you know office work actually was and if we can harness that and really just get people focused on the productivity and i know there's a need for downtime and the social and the interaction that that's part of it but you know how one i guess how inefficient have organizations really been and and how do we how does that transition coming out of this and, uh, well yeah I, I do have some thoughts on that i you know one of the problems is that when we talk about most high growth companies and you know, many of them are in B2B. What you're doing is you're taking people your daughter's age and come out of college while their life force is still strong and they don't know they're being exploited and you're just like sucking the life out of them, right? And getting as much as we can. And the idea is we create almost like a college-like experience where they don't have to leave campus. All meals are provided, valet service, we'll do your dry cleaning, we'll run your errands. Just don't leave and stay at your desk, Right. Right. And, and that's really an attempt to get more productivity out of people. But again, in completely the wrong environment, you'd be better off to let people customize their lives. And so we have this weird mix of industrial era thinking where it's unit work per unit time and keep your butt in the chair. And that's right. how we're going to measure your productivity if you're there from nine to five. When in reality, you might have three, four good hours in your day and as long as I am productive and I can self-regulate, but then you get the most out of me and let me enjoy my golfing or whatever I'm going to do if I decide to take a long lunch. But if it's going to be this kind of weird nanny state where you're going to micromanage my presence, that's not very smart. Yeah. So if you're not hiring people whom you trust, it's a problem. Yeah, agreed. I think there is going to be a massive learning curve for, for some companies. I mean, you saw some of the videos or the memes out there of, you know, folks that are taping their mouse to a Roomba. So it looks like their screen's active all the time and they're working. I'm like, man, if somebody's <laughs> managing that, they're, 
Yeah, at some point, we've got now, to now, now, you do need that. Like, my kids are going to school virtually out here in San Diego right now. And, you know, they take attendance and they spot check whether it's like you say, they say your name. And if you don't answer because, you you know, you're, you're playing Call of Duty or whatever on the <laughs> other screen. Napping. <laughs> yeah, or napping, then it's a problem, you know. So they do want to make sure you're, you're there without forcing you to turn on your video. But, again, it's, it's a matter of, I think, trust. And what a lot of people, you know, again, going back to habits, a lot of people are going to yeah. see the advantages of working remotely and they're going to say, you know, why are you going to force me to commute and spend two hours of my life every day commuting uh, without any particular advantage to me or the company? Right. And the smart companies will turn around and say, yeah, let's get rid of the high fixed cost and the real estate and let's get access to a worldwide workforce because, yeah, we know it works remotely. So why do we limit ourselves to people that are in Toledo, Ohio, where we happen to be or something like that? I 100% agree. And I think what the companies that don't adapt that are not going to, all the good people are going to go to those companies that do it. So <laughs> holding out of the past is not, not going to work. So, you know, it's fascinating. So, all right. So the other one that I thought we could dig into is, which may transition us into a little bit of the marketing of the business. How do I grow my business is, you know, the gift giving and reciprocity, right? Mm -hmm. I thought that chapter was super interesting that give expecting nothing thereof, basically. But when you do that, you subconsciously, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, that other person feels the need to give something back. I mean, yeah. So we were bred to transmit culture. That's probably too big a topic to go into on, on a podcast, but I have a couple of chapters on that. We actually evolved to transmit culture. And in order for us to be able to do that, a couple of things need to happen. We have to be cooperative and we have to transmit it without any changes. So if you're the squeaky wheel, or actually the, the nail that sticks out, you're going to get hammered. So, you know, if you, I tell you, hey, Brett, the earth's flat. And you go, well, you know, I was on the mast of the ship and then I kind of saw the horizon curving a little. And I, it might be a sphere that we're living on. You know, you'd get thrown off that ship, right? Because yeah. I just need you to repeat, the earth is flat when I tell you that, okay? And that keeps tr tribal cohesion. It keeps any cultural innovations uh, spreading very quickly. So basically there's like groupthink that happens. So we have to be cooperative and we actually get censured for doing anything that's where we're not transmitting the culture of our tribe in, the, in a high fidelity manner. But, but the other part of that is the cooperation is we have to be able to know that if we share resources, if I give you a gift, I have to reliably get something of equal or greater value back. Because if I don't, then that whole cooperation thing breaks down. Right. And so gift giving, this is the key insight from an evolutionary standpoint, giving a gift obligates the receiver. So, you know, have you ever been to, well, pre COVID in the airport and there's like Hare Krishna's and they'll, they'll give you one of those little paper little flowers. flowers that yeah, they just yeah, made. Yeah. And then they're like, Oh, can I have some change? And you're like, sure. And you give them 50 cents and it cost them about a cent and a half to make that paper flower. So they're ahead and they can reliably do that all day long and collect money for their organization. So even don't want to do it and you know what they're doing to you and you know what's coming and you still feel obligated. Yes. And so in order for cooperation to work, we have to be able to reliably expect something back when we give them something, a resource. And so a lot of marketing is built on that free gifts, trial offers, take the car out for a test drive. That also combines it with a sense of ownership, which is another evolutionary thing I talk about. But yeah, so I would work really hard in my business figuring out what valuable gifts I could give. Yeah. And even down to the individual, right? We talk personal brands and you can say that I like that topic or not. I mean, you are who you are. It's maybe not a brand. It's just you. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that old theory of don't give away your good stuff, right? Your good content and gate it where, you know, I, more recently, I one I've adopted to have heard more, you know, just give away your good stuff. Like people aren't going to want to do it themselves. You're going to get a whole lot more value. Oh back yeah. Well, look in, in professional services, that's, that's absolutely black and white. In other words, if you say, well, let's say I'm an estate planning for high net worth individuals. Okay. It's like, yeah. okay, you're, you're getting old, you know, you got to figure out your family succession stuff. 
here's your 170 point checklist of what you need to do. I'm going to tell you everything here, this, this, and this, and then file in probate and then get a trust and then get durable power of attorney, do all this stuff. There you go, do it. And you're going to say, screw that, just do it for me and I'll pay you, right? So right. in professional services, you should tell them in as much detail as you can about what they should do. Spill the beans, give it all to them. Yeah, it makes sense. And I do want to go back when you, we started down this, you talked about the, the tribe and I thought that was super interesting. And what well, kind of maybe, I don't want to say dangerous is the right word, but you get everybody thinking the same way, outside concepts don't make sense. But where I see the value and I've seen more of it is creating your own tribe, right? So any business, if I'm a founder, I'm starting a company, the more you can build a tribe around your product, your service, your offering, the better chance of, of growing that business, which I think ties back to everybody wants a sense of belonging. And if your product yeah. can be, is that, is that a fair way? To yeah, no, no, that's fair. So, so the best way to look at human evolution, the reason we cooperate is because we can learn more from our surrounding cultural package than we could ever in a single lifetime by ourselves. Right. And that's why we took over the planet like a plague of locusts. But that but we're learning from our tribe and it's really it's almost like the tribe has the power. And you can think of human history as collisions between and among tribes. So the individual doesn't matter as much. It's the cohesion and effectiveness of your tribe when it's competing with other tribes. And so we naturally form into tribes. The, the thing that makes us different than herd animals than other mammals is that we can actually overlap our identity and simultaneously be in several tribes. No, As you may know, I'm the head shaving tribe, right? <laughs> I have no hair. I'm also the Mercedes driving tribe. I'm the blue state California tribe. And I mean, so there's like overlays of different identities that are activated depending on the context we're in. Some of these tribes are chosen, some are not. You don't have, you don't choose to be in the orphan tribe or the, you know, I want to be a, a particular minority that's discriminated against in this country tribe, right? Those aren't right. choices you make or gender identity and things like that. So it's really important to figure out where you're going to attach to people. And I don't know if it's so much about making your own new tribe is being super clear on who your target is. So all marketing and all, you know, business foundation is figure out with laser focus who your tribe is. Number one, number two, understand their values. And number three, figure out the messaging and the product features that are going to support that. Yeah. It seems so Most of them start with the features and then they're like, well, who will we sell this crap to? It's completely backwards. Yeah. I mean, that's why I love the science of this because it makes sense when you explain it, it makes sense, <laughs> you know, why we do certain things. And I do, you know, I keep taking this back, but the, you know, even a follow up, I think you mentioned in the book that, you know, we'd like to think of ourselves as individuals and thinking individually, but that's, that's not accurate. Right. If I read that right, well, we, we do, know, but we're. So, so here's the weird part in the West. We think that the most important thing is that I'm an individual, my individual happiness matters, my life path is important, all of this stuff, right? That in itself is a cultural idea that snuck into our heads. That's only a belief we have in the West because that's you. the cultural package we're getting from people around us. In the East, they don't have any, that, that cultural package doesn't exist. They're part of a collective, much more community oriented, much more respectful of precedent and elders and things like that. And actually, that's much closer to the biological reality of it, because it's hard to maintain tribal cohesion with a tribe of unique individuals, because yeah. they don't think differently. So we're at a disadvantage against the hive mind of where people think similarly. Yeah. Fascinating. Fat, I mean, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And we could talk about this for a couple of hours, at least I could and pick your brain. Absolutely. On it, but, but I do want to be respectful of your time. And, uh, you know, is there, before I get to my, my kind of last two questions, any parting wisdom or thoughts for founders is, you know, they're starting this journey that, you know, based on what the science tells you or your 25 years of experience, I and mean, obviously the marketing is going to be important, but, you know, to avoid, you know, some of the, Again, follow the science, right? It's, it's not going to steer you wrong. Yeah, but. Well, well at, at the level of the individual, again, I would say sleep is by far the most important thing you can do for your self-care. And I have a prescriptive chapter at the end of the book, How to Be More Primal, towards the end. And one of the things I stress again is, is sleep. It's just not optional. 
at an organizational level, I think that, you know, people talk about culture a lot. And usually it's a, here's our mission statement and our vision statement. Therefore, this is our culture. You know, we can have fun little acronyms. We're transparent and fun and, you know, whatever. Pardon me, but that's all bullshit. So if you want to understand your culture, watch people's behavior along dimensions like, are they willing to take risks? Are they willing to make mistakes and speak up? Do they actually enjoy each other or are they very guarded and closed and territorial? And that's the reality. That's your culture. Now, you can throw out a few people that are making it that way if you think it's negative or get more of the people that you need to reinforce certain aspects of that. But start with a reality check on your culture because the cohesion of your company depends on that. Yeah. And I guess your employees are the most important thing, not your customers. It's your employees. If they're not pulling together, it's a problem. So I would say that get a realistic assessment of your tribal values by, if you're a leader, talking last and by doing a bunch of informal stuff and by paying attention and just watching behavior. Yeah, it's interesting too. I mean, is there necessarily a right or wrong or is it aligning with your values? Because your values could be different, right? Everybody's telling me you got to be the do good, social good, right? Yeah, and again, I, yeah. I'm just curious your perspective on that. Or quote unquote success for financial success or dominance or critical mass in a B2B business. I'd say that they're really is no correct set of values. What's important is, again, how tight and cohesive the adherence to your values is. Is if you have a team of sled dogs and they're all pulling in the same direction, that's not very productive. So the, just get them pulling in the same direction. Interesting. Yeah, which I'm a big believer in, you know, the employee experience first, that leads to customer experience, and then you can kind of figure out the rest if you get those two pieces right. So. Yep. Oh, interesting. Absolutely. Interesting. All right. So as we, we wrap this up, Tim, what's next for you? What are we, I mean, we're winding down the end of this year. What's, what are you working on here? Next? Well, I'm actually looking forward to the return of in-person speaking, believe it or not. In January, I have my first in-person event again, a keynoting in Florida and Orlando. I lost about a dozen events from Bologna, Italy to Moscow to Sao Paulo, Brazil <laughs> during this thing. And uh, I miss those days. I really enjoy the travel. I enjoy meeting people and, and speaking at conferences. So hopefully that's coming back. I've been doing plenty of virtual events, of course, but uh, that's an important one for me. And also, I'm, I'm very much enjoying the digital marketing consulting. Now that I've sold off my share of my agency, I'm doing a lot of executive advisory, being nice. essentially a shadow CMO with unlimited on-call access to a senior executive at a company. And that's a lot of fun because I don't have to do the operational stuff, but I can deliver a lot of insights based on uh, the work that we've done in, in our agency in the past. Yeah, the experiences. Again, I think that's where we're, you know, I came from kind of a mix of sales and marketing and demand generation customers. So I've been in each of the functions. And I mean, I think if you can't get the, I don't want to call it the traditional marketing, right? But the demand gen and the digital aspect of this, right? I don't care how many salespeople you have, you're never going to be able to scale that company. So, I mean, I think the more people we have like you that are guiding some of these companies, I think the better off, you know, these, these companies are. So, oh, awesome. And for the folks that actually can see the video behind Tim is all of, not all of his, it's probably a sampling of his keynote badges from his, you know, <laughs> wall of fame, if you will. So I got yeah, a couple a hundred of them. Like, a change, right? Going virtually when you're spending an international travel all the time, just being, I don't want to say stuck in San Diego. I don't know if I yeah, yeah, stuck in San Diego. So I have to walk down to the ocean in order to do my Tai Chi by the cliffs there. Yeah, it's rough. It's all good. So yeah, like maybe this is maybe our first step towards a little bit of normalcy and, and getting back out because I think a lot of people are ready to. Well, I think we should take this opportunity to not think of it as a return to quote unquote normal. This is an there. opportunity to really reimagine some fundamental things and question assumptions we've been making. I don't want to go back to the old normal. There's silver linings in, in this mess and hopefully we'll be able to learn from it. Yeah, I, I think so. I think you're you're 100 right, and thank you for correcting me. But you, you are right because you know one of the things I've been preaching quite a bit is the opportunity in the B2B space now to really transform this space. I mean, we still get a lot of people looking at just 
silo by silo how we can improve and I said you can fundamentally shift the way the buyers are thinking and buying from you know home offices and doing these other things you you wouldn't structure an organization today the way you would have even 10 years ago so I think fundamentally there's a lot of really cool stuff that's coming and the people that figure it out first you know there's definitely a lot of of opportunity so you know like I said I'm was a creature of habit but now I'm like change you know what's tomorrow going to bring let's let's figure it out right <laughs> yeah i think that there's you can't see past certain kind of nexuses it's, there's a fog and a darkness or whatever you want to say and we can't see past this one you know so you have to be comfortable in the middle of this just floating along and just be ready Not necessarily if you if you're driving for something i think this is more of a time to sense and for emergent stuff to come out as opposed to driving blindly at 100 miles an hour into the fog ahead no i think that's right always good advice and that's why you're on the show <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, all right so last question i promise and is when i ask everybody is you know what is one thing you would highly recommend and if you're going to say sleep I 100% agree, but do you have something outside of sleep that you would Oh, no, no, I, de yeah, I, I definitely do. So this is for all of my you know, CEO and executive friends. There's a plug-in, actually a technical tool that I use in conjunction with LinkedIn. It's called Crystal, and the website is crystalnose.com. And so, for example, before I came on your podcast, I looked at your disc personality and saw you're very close to me. You're high dominance and influence, a little more of a driver than me. And basically, it's like x-ray vision about someone's personality before you even meet them. And I find uh, that if you're in any kind of leadership, marketing, or sales role, it's an invaluable tool. That's super cool. I'm going to check that out. <laughs> What's, what was it called? Crystal it's Nose? Crystal Nose is the website. Nose as in K-N-O-W-S. Okay. Uh, Crystalnose.com. And it's basically just pulling it. And it I, yeah, it's scraping your, uh, your your LinkedIn profile and based on the text, it's coming up with a personality type for you and pretty accurately, I will say. It also has a lot of prescriptive things. Like if I'm trying to deliver bad news to you in an email, it'll give you that level of prescriptive advice wow. as well. God bless the creative people, man. <laughs> I say it all the time when I have entrepreneurs and, and authors on here. I mean, I'm just in awe of what people come up with and how they think about it and how they drive these things. I'm more of an execution guy. So fascinating. Definitely. We'll check that one. Yeah. Out. Well, to me, the, you know, the bottom line is uh, what that is also a through thread through that tool and my book is understanding people is the biggest payoff you can have. It's not about the technology and it's sorry, it's not even about the execution. It's really it's about people. understanding yourself and other people. And, and so I'm focusing on this durable okay. stuff that's going to serve me in a variety of spheres instead of some narrow technical thing that's going to be obsolete in a year. Fascinating. Awesome. Well, that was definitely a, a new one. And, you know, lastly, and I'm sure people are going to want to follow up and I'd highly encourage one, the book, but two, your content is, is really good. What's the best place for folks to find you and connect with you? Well, if you're talking about me speaking or doing marketing training for your team or doing a brutal takedown of your website and what's wrong with it, all that stuff is on timash.com. And if you want information about the book, it's available in ebook, as you mentioned, audiobook narrated by me and uh, pre release autograph paperbacks at this point on, on the website, primalbrain.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tim, thank you again for taking the time. This was really interesting. Like I said, I probably could have talk to your ear off for another hour or so. So maybe yeah, we'll be come back, come back and the next year and <laughs> dig in deeper. So appreciate it. It's been my pleasure, Brett. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.